All right. Oh, thank you so much, John. You know, he just, he was telling me earlier that he was scheduled to sing at a um, Swallows Day Parade event outdoors. And, you know, the rain kind of prevented him from doing that. And how blessed are we to have him today. So thank you for being here. All right. So today's talk is new now what's next. Yeah, exactly. And we've this whole month we've been focusing focusing on the topic of, well, that's how we've never done it. Right? Week one, it's a brand new baby day. We in we were invited to seize the day, carpe diem, seize the moment, and to embrace the unlimited possibilities available to us all. And we specifically focused on um, those people who have experienced some oppression in their lives and how they um, how they ins found inspiring ways to overcome that. And you know, that was a victory for us all because we're all one, right? In week two, up until now, we acknowledged our past, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, while still allowing the power of forgiveness to disentangle ourselves from the bad and the ugly, um, we, we could then shift our focus on what we do want rather than you know, staying stuck in the old story, dwelling in old patterns. And then in week three last, last week, tell me something good. We were encouraged to release our need to figure anything out and to simply align spirit, you know, allow wisdom to move through us, uh, to guide us. So today, our focus is upon three related ideas, and they are number one, who are we? And what are we going to do about it? Number two, moving from survive to thrive. And number three, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. So who are we and what are we going to do about it? Who are we? In our Declaration of Principles, Ernest Holmes says, we believe in the individualization of the spirit in us and that all people are individualizations of the one spirit. We are individualizations of the one spirit, which means that we, each one of us, are imbued with all of the qualities of God. We are each way more than we even realize. We're bigger than our bodies, which is a John Mayer saying. We are bigger than our thoughts. We are bigger than anything of which we could even conceive. So I'm just going to invite you to just take a brief moment and close your eyes and, and go within and just ask yourself this question. Who am I? Like, how do you identify yourself? Perhaps as a parent or a grandparent or a spouse or maybe your vocation. Who am I? And what have you accomplished? Perhaps you got your degree, you won a race, you have a successful career. And how do you see yourself in the world? Now come back into the room. You are infinitely more than that. What you just thought about yourself is like one grain of sand on a huge beach of who you really are. I know some of us have been in, in classes and in friendship circles, and have you ever had that conversation about the infinitude of God? I know I've been in a couple of them. And um, anytime we talk about the infinite God, it just blows my mind. It's those moments where my human brain cannot even wrap itself around the concept of God's infinite nature. And I love that phrase. It wrinkles my brain, man. <laughs> you know, because it really captures us as human beings on this plane never being able to embody God's totality. 
And we are that. We are individualizations of this one, infinite, mind-wrinkling spirit. We are imbued with its nature, and our own potentiality is also mind-wrinkling. So this is who we are. What we're going to do about it, we're going to take it a little deeper. So as we awaken over and over again to this new way of being, to realizing who we are, to continually, continually embodying the truth of our wholeness and our oneness with the one, and as we realize we're much bigger than we know ourselves to be, we will then have more connection with our good. And the more connection we have with our good, the more we move forward in consciousness. And the more we move forward in consciousness, the more evolution we have. And this evolution moves us from a place of getting and having to a place of just being. The wholeness of God, the love of God, the abundance of God is not just available to us. It's actually who and what we are. It's our inherent nature. So as we consciously evolve and deepen our realization about who we are, we need not, no longer be stuck in the getting and having, but just being what we are. Doesn't that sound much easier? Easier to just be than to get and have. And who we are is being the wholeness, being the love, being the peace, being the joy, being the abundance, being the creativity. Being those God qualities that you wish to experience. And we are, when we are being who and what we are, you know, the outer world gets to benefit from it as well. Because going back to that oneness, your good is my good, my good is your good. There's no separation. And of course, you know, as we embody this truth of ourselves, it doesn't mean our lives are going to be perfect. You know, we live in this planet with over 8 billion people, right? And everyone has a different point of view. We're still going to have conflict. We're still going to have errant thinking. But, that's a big but, the more we, <laughs> the more we are being the peace, the more we are being the love, the more we are being the joy, the more we are connected with our God selves. And the more we are connected with our God selves, the less our outer circumstances dictate our own happiness and well-being. I'm going to say that again. The more connected we are with our God selves, the less our outer situations dictate our own happiness and well-being. And when we consciously accept this divine humanness, when we stand in our own power as individualizations of the one spirit, we can then ask ourselves this beautiful question, what's mine to do? And then listen for the answer and move forward with purpose, with our purpose in this world. So we just talked about who, who we are, the individualizations of spirit, and what we're going to do about it. We're going to be it. So you have to remember this, because I'm going to give you a quiz at the end. <laughs> be ready. So now let's discuss moving from survive to thrive. So over the history of mankind, um, our, the survival of the human beings as a species has been not only served by our instincts, but also by our strongly developed ego. And I'm talking about ego with a lowercase e. Um, I only make this distinction because in the glossary of the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes defines ego with a capital E as such. The I am of the Bible, the Christ, the perfect idea of God. In metaphysical terms, the ego, the capital E, refers to the real consciousness, capital R, capital C, of man. In psychology, it carries a slight variation of interpretation, implying an organization or system of mental states. In this textbook, we frequently use it 
merely to convey the thought of the inner man, the real self. So the ego that I'm referring to right now is the psychology version. And this, this ego includes patterns in thinking that are rooted in prejudgment, in fear, and in separation. So historically, humans have been served by the ego, as I said, for the survival of our species, but now we're in a different stage of human conscious evolution, and we've learned that the ego is now a tool. It's simply a tool, and it's not to be confused with our identity. And we've learned that we can choose to be governed by something, something much bigger than our ego's narrow perspective. So what this looks like for us is to move from survive to thrive. And we do this by choosing, I'm saying choosing to release our fear and embrace love. Simple. This release, release our fear and embrace love. So for us to thrive, we must retrain our tendencies towards separation, which is releasing the fear, and celebrate our oneness, celebrate our connection, and that's embracing love. So in embracing love, this oneness, I'm not just referring to our connection with other human beings, but also our connection with animals, with nature, with the universe. This, all of this is our connection with God. And John's so beautifully saying about um, the connection with nature and take me home country roads. Um, I know that music is just one of the infinite pathways that initiate this, this connection with life. As is prayer and meditation, art, dance, poetry, the list goes on. For us to thrive, we must continually bring ourselves back to our relationship with everything around us. Walt Whitman does it so beautifully in his poem, The Voice of Rain. He writes, And who art thou? said I to the soft falling shower, which, strange to tell, gave me an answer as here translated. I am the poem of earth, said the voice of the rain. Eternal I rise, impalpable out of the land and the bottomless sea. Upward to heaven, whence vaguely formed, altogether changed, yet the same. I descend to lay the droughts, atomies, dust layers of the globe, and all that in them without me, were seeds only, latent, unborn. And forever by day and night, I give back life to my own origin and make pure and beautify it. For song, issuing from its birthplace, after fulfillment, wandering, wrecked or unwrecked, duly with love returns. So as we consciously find more ways to connect with all of life, we then intentionally move from survive to thrive. This will be on the quiz too. <laughs> so chop wood, carry water. I'm sure we've all heard the, the Zen proverb, proverb before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. It's telling us that in this divine human form on this planet, as our awareness with oneness deepens, the tasks before us remain the same, but the consciousness we bring to them changes. Our sense, our connection with the whole infuses every action and activity with more love. Our groundedness in truth infuses our simplest acts with a light. 
And this light can be a beacon for all others. As the world commemorates Palm Sunday today, we're, we are reminded of the awareness that the master teacher Jesus gave, his awareness and his groundedness. He demonstrated to us not only love, but the letting go of ego, the letting go of the need for approval from others, the letting go of worry and fear, the letting go of the need to be right, and the letting go of the events before him unfolding without interference. He knew what was going to happen and that he still walked in. So he was trusting in his higher good. Jesus was a master teacher for a reason. He walked this earth being love, being peace, being wholeness, being joy, being creativity, being abundance. But he was just the example of who all of us are. And from this newly awakened perspective as individualizations of the one spirit, we're just wisely guided to our next steps while continuing to chop wood, carry water, So what's next? Well, I know because we're all here in this room, we're already on a spiritual path of growing, learning, and expansion. And maybe for some of us, this may be new. Um, but in truth, you've been on this journey your whole life. You really have. And that's a whole other talk. So, <laughs> Others of us may feel as though we've come a long way on our path. You know, I've been in this teaching for over 25 years, and there is infinitely more. There always will be more, always. I recently was watching um, someone from the platform, and um, they mentioned that they had reached the top of their spiritual practices in our teaching and don't know where else to go but out there. And what that means is out there in the world, you know, doing, you know, rather than expanding what's within. And I have to say that I, I disagree with that. I disagree with the ceiling they put on our teachings. And they went even as so far as to say is that Buddhism was an ineffective tool for peace in the world because there's still wars going on. And I disagree with that as well. I don't believe we are here to decide what's working in the lives of others. My belief is that it's not mine to judge nor mine to do. Earlier I asked you to think about who you are, reminding you that you are infinitely more than that. This is because there is never a limit to your growth. There is never a limit to who you are. And while I believe there's absolutely nothing wrong with going out there to do good, good works in the world and selflessly serving, I know that you know, our focus here in the science of mind is to just remember who we are, to remember our truth. And if it's your calling to go out there and be an activist for good on this planet, I think that is awesome. That is what you're called to do. That's probably God's beautiful will for you. But here we teach the science of mind to more deeply connect with who we are and then express it in whatever way it is calling to us. And it looks different, again, for each one of us. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you, well, actually, our teaching is like, we do not tell you what to think, also what to do. We tell you or we teach you how to think and more expansively to question and to remember your truth and oneness. So, are you ready for the quiz? Here it comes. Don't worry, it's going to be easy because I'm going to give you the answers. <laughs> okay, number one. Who are we? Yeah. We are individualizations of the one spirit. Number two, what are we going to do about it? 
We're going to be it. Yeah, thrive. We're going to be it. And how are we going to move from strive to thrive? We're going to consciously connect with life itself, however it is, music, poetry, dance, hiking. Okay, you guys got this one. What happens before enlightenment? What happens after enlightenment? There you go. A plus. <laughs> Give yourself a hand. <laughs> I'd like to close with this passage from Joel Goldsmith's book, Practicing the Presence. It kind of says it all. There's an old, old story about a great spiritual teacher who knocked at the gates of heaven for admission into paradise. After some time, God came to the door and inquired, who is there? Who knocks? To this query came the confident response, it is I. Sorry, very sorry, there is no room in heaven. Go away. You will have to come back some other time. The good man, surprised at the rebuff, went away, puzzled. After several years spent meditating and pondering over this strange reception, he returned and knocked again at the gate. He was met with the same question and gave a similar response. Once again, he was told there was no room in heaven. It was completely filled at the time. In the years that passed, the teacher went deeper and deeper within himself, meditating and pondering. After a long period of time had elapsed, he knocked at the gates of heaven for the third time. Again, God asked, who was there? This time, his answer was, thou art. And the gates opened wide as God said, come in. There was never room for me and thee. There is not God and you or I. There is only God expressed manifested as individual being. There is only one life, the Father's, and we are outside of heaven with no hope of gaining entrance into it as long as we believe we have a selfhood apart from God, a being separate and independent of God. Through, through the ages, duality has separated us from our good, but it is a sense of duality, not duality, because there is no duality. The secret of life is oneness, and oneness is not something we bring about. Oneness is a state of being. And so it is. Yeah.